Okay. Good morning, everyone. And uh, good morning to our students here online as well. Okay, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Let's just thank the Lord for this week. Let's thank God for uh, His favor upon us. It's so good to just be able to come into His presence, study, learn. So let's just commit this day, this week into God's hands. Let's pray. Father, we once again thank you for this new week that you have added into our lives. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the ability to learn and to study. And I pray, God, that you will continue to speak in and through us, minister to us, Lord, even as we are coming to the close of this course. I thank you for what you have taught us thus far and things that you're teaching us now also, Lord. We just commit our hearts into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Just, just a moment. Okay. All right. So last class, we I think we did chapter 12 and chapter 13. Yes? Sorry? We completed chapter 13? 12. Okay. So we have to get into chapter 13 today. OK. No, I think we did chapter 13, right? Can you double check? Okay, no, we did chapter 11 and 12, sorry. Yeah, so we'll begin with chapter 13. Okay, so chapter 13, we talk about strategies for urban evangelism. Now, when you talk about urban, right? Uh, so there's two things, there's urban and there's rural, right? Urban is mostly tier one, tier two cities where it's more of a city life, right? And then you've got rural, which is more of towns and villages. Now, many of us may be from towns and villages. Many of us, you know, we, we learned in chapter one, right, that uh, towns and villages are becoming more like cities. 2000 and after 2020, after the lockdown and after the pandemic, everything went online, right? So even village pastors know how to hold meetings on Zoom. So things have changed. So now we look at how can we do urban evangelism in cities and towns, and can also include villages. How can we do evangelism? And what are the strategies that we can use when it comes to evangelism, right? So we use the term urban missions and urban evangelism interchangeably. That means um, it's like, Urban missions, urban evangelism, both go together. Both are the same, right? You can interchange them. So what is the most powerful method to evangelize with people? So it says here, wholesome methods. Everyone say wholesome. The word wholesome means right methods, right? As believers, we must be right before God and right before man, right? So what is the two-step uh, three steps here in a wholesome method. Number one, being spirit-led. In evangelism, wherever we are ministering to people, we must be led by the Spirit. Why? Remember, we talked about this. When you are sharing the gospel with somebody, we are just giving the message. Who is doing the change? Who is speaking to them? It's the Holy Spirit. Right? We are just giving the message. Ah, Jesus came, he died on the cross, he took up our sins. And now, because of that, he resurrected again. And because of what he did, we are righteous, we are justified. That's all we are saying. It's just words. But it's the Holy Spirit that adds power to that word. So when we are evangelizing, especially when we are ministering one-on-one, -on -one, 
and even if we are you know ministering in our youth settings or you become a pastor you're you're sharing uh, your sunday sermons number one be spirit led uh, remember that verse we talked about in galatians those who are led by the spirit of god are sons of god right so be spirit led when you're leading the worship when you're ministering to people when you're uh, even just you know praying alone in your room be spirit led depend on the holy spirit depend on yes we have gifts talents right but you depend on the holy spirit to make a difference amen right number two be legal meaning now I, I was sharing this in the other class um, uh, you know there was there's this pastor that i know of and he he called me he said a lot of persecution i know he's been a pastor for about five years uh, in north india and he said a lot of persecution people are coming and you know constantly persecuting coming and troubling the church troubling the believers so i told him why don't you give a police complaint just give a complaint and be on the safer side know that you know okay i'm doing all this i'm not converting people i'm just sharing the gospel every sunday that's all i'm doing i'm not going out and converting people so i said you do a police complaint so he said okay and then when he came, then after a few weeks or so we spoke again and he said i could not do a police complaint i said why because i don't have a trust i don't I, the this church doesn't have trust so i said how many years is your church working for five years so five years what you've been doing nothing every sunday come to church church is growing they have the service offering will come the offering i don't know what they do with the offering over church so I said to him, I remember saying that legally, you're doing something wrong. You're doing wrong. Oh, but it's ministry, no. I'm doing ministry. But you do ministry wherever you want to do, you do. But do it legally. What does the law say? Even if you are starting a, a small organization, you have to have a trust or a society. Right, so now when persecution has come, he's not able to file a police complaint. Now, whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? Right, it's not our fault. See, persecution will keep coming till Jesus Christ comes back again, that we cannot stop. But we must be legally right. Right, so first thing I told him go open the trust. How long will it take? In one month, you'll get the trust. Well, five years of year. Okay, he didn't know initially. What is five years now? He said, open the trust. After opening the trust, you go file a police complaint. Say, this is what it is. I'm not doing anything, but these people are coming and causing trouble. So legally, you're doing what is right. Right? And also told him, every Sunday, what offering comes, you write it down in a book or a diary, or maintain an Excel sheet. Write it down. Keep it. You're doing it. You're doing something that is legally, and you're doing something that is right. Right? Three, be ethical. You know, the word ethical means don't fool people. Don't do things which is not right in the eyes of God. OK? So for example, we may say, okay, I'm doing ministry, but we may do it the wrong way. Let me give you an example, right? So you may go out on outreach. Hey, I want to invite you to a church service. And this person is asking, what happens in the church service? Nothing, only songs and somebody will come and teach. No, that is not ethical. That's not right to say. Are you doing a good work? of going out on the street, inviting people to church. Is that a good work? Very good work. I'm doing evangelism. But how you're doing it is wrong. Get what I'm saying, 
right? We can do things which is good, but do it the wrong way. Because if this person comes to church and he says, hey, you didn't tell me it's about Jesus. You didn't tell me that, you know, there's going to be songs like this. And you didn't tell me about all of this. Why didn't you tell me? Or you're inviting somebody for a youth concert. Come for this concert. What happens in the concert? You know, we are singing some songs. Nice band is there. They will sing one few songs. And then uh, we'll have refreshments and go back home. Now, you're inviting, but it's done the wrong way. You get what I'm saying? So be ethical. So be clear. See, this is a church service. We're going to be talking about Jesus. We believe in the Bible. This is what the Bible teaches us. And it's a youth concert. OK, we're going to sing songs about Jesus. And it's a place where you can come and experience God. If you like to, please come. Now, whether they come or no, that is up to them. But you have been ethical. You get what I'm saying? Right now, in ministry, some of you may plant churches. And after planting a church, after three years, one church member will come and say, we've, you know, we've supported you so much. Show us where is the funds, where you spent all the funds. What will you say? You have to be able to show it. You have to be able to show it. Right? So if you go to our church website um, and you go to, uh, uh, you know, in our, in our church website from 2001, all the yearly, you know, uh, uh, expenses, everything is there till now. How many years? Yeah. Everything is there. How much came in, how much was spent, what is the balance? Every year it's accounted for. Anyone from the church can take it, take a look at it. Being ethical. Right? So when we are doing ministry, we become all things to people. We step into their world. We try to understand. We relate with them. We identify with them. So never take advantage that, hey, I'm a, I'm a pastor or I'm a minister, I'm a youth leader. Never take advantage. What are the three things? Number one, say, what is it? Spirit led. Two, legal. One small. Yeah. Very important. Spirit led, legal, and ethical. Be, we talked about all of this, right? Be culturally sensitive, be culturally relevant. What works in one place may not work in another place. Right now, if I'm going to, uh, you know, somewhere in deep into the uh, jungle areas, now I cannot say open uh, the book of Leviticus. We'll talk about, uh, uh, you know, guilt offering, sin offering. They will say, "What is this? And what should I talk about? Something very simple, right?" Now, if I go to a city church, if it's a city church, I can talk about something which is higher, more relevant, so that people can understand, right? So be relevant where you are. Uh, we seek not to intentionally offend people, but to minister in such a way to draw them to Christ. Now, remember the Apostle Paul, Acts 17, we, we studied about that whole thing, right? Paul went into uh, Athens, and then he saw all of it. He said to an unknown God, he didn't offend them. He didn't say, what is this? Full of idols everywhere. He didn't offend them. He, he actually you know, exhorted them. He said, see, I see that you people are very religious. So let me tell you about who this Jesus is. This God that you are searching for, I will tell you. I never offend people. Right? Now, in, uh, you know, being in ministry, I've, I've, I've seen many times, right, more than others, Christians offend others, and it's hurtful. You know, in 2008, 2007, uh, 8 or 9, there was this big persecution that was happening against Christians in the city of Mangalore, right? Uh, a lot of persecutions. So, you know, I went to Mangalore in 2018, and I, I, I began to, you know, see what's happening there. There was no persecution. I went, we went to the malls, we did street ministry. In four years, nobody came and asked me, right, why you're doing this. 
So I tried to find out what is the reason for that persecution. And I was surprised to find out the reason. Some churches, some pastors of the churches, what they did was they began to say, you know, idols are demons and, you know, don't go there. They, they're all devils and all of these things. So what happened? Some of them heard it. Now people from other faiths got upset. So what did they do? They came and destroyed the church. Now whose fault is it? But when we look at it, hey, they came and destroyed the church. But what do you did for that? Because I was surprised. I was in Mangalore. I said, never. Very good people. Very good people. All four years, we were out on the streets. We were doing carols in the malls. Nothing happened. The moment you, we and I, you and I offend people, they will retaliate. So be very careful. You know, especially if you're a pastor, you're leading in church, don't talk about other religions and about what they are doing. Talk about this. Talk about the Bible. What does Jesus say? You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. They may be doing 100 things wrong. Now, we don't have to talk about what they are doing wrong. But you talk about the truth. Let the truth speak to them. You understand? Right? So the mistake we make is we talk, we tell, uh, you know, this person did that, that church or that faith is like this. Not required. The time that God has given you to preach or teach, teach it from the word of God. It is the word of God that can change people. Right? So do ministry in such a way not to offend, but to draw people to Christ. Um, there's no opportunity to blame uh, identify and develop strategies. So some of the strategies that we use here uh, in page 42 uh, in APC, what we do is the catalyst ministry where we go into schools and one hour, or I think it's one or two hours a week, we teach the children about the Bible, right? We teach them some scriptures or some stories. So that's the catalyst ministry. Then we have the youth ministry seminars, campus elevates, uh, youth life groups, youth concerts. Then the young adults, uh, those who are getting into the workplace, we have seminars like preparing for marriage, life skills, professionals group, and married and families. Uh, we have the women's conference, men's conference, Christless counseling. So then there's uh, for areas of need, right? So people who are suicidal, drug addictions, those seeking for jobs, homeless. We we you know we help them to. Uh, you know, help to evangelize with them or help to encourage them, reach out to them, right? And then strategies addressing different spheres of activity. So this is a seven mountain assignment. Not sure if you've heard of it, but the seven mountain are the seven areas in society, in the world, seven areas where people are working. So look at those seven areas, education, Arts and entertainment, media, business, government, family, and religion. So these are the seven broad aspects. So we will be in any one of these seven, right? So if you talk about uh, uh, if you're in full-time ministry, then it's going to be religion, right? Or if you're somebody in uh, in the business, you got business. Somebody who wants to be a music teacher, you got arts and entertainment, or a dance teacher, right? Arts and entertainment. Or you want to be a teacher in the school or college, you got education, right? So these are the different uh, areas or spheres of influence. And so we got to develop strategies to reach out to those spheres of influence. Now, what are the tools that are available right now to reach out to people? Newspaper, books, right? Uh, I remember many times I have, you know, we give books to people. Hey, why don't you read this book? And the book ministers to them, right? And I always uh, like to do that, right? Because I'm not explaining about the book. I, I remember I had relatives, and they would give me books when I just became a believer. They, you read this book, or you read this book, and you begin to read it. And, I, and mostly those books were about church history, about these great men and women of God. And I used to be so in awe. 
these people come to India or they go to different countries and they do such a great work, all in such a young age, right? and you get encouraged. So sharing books, then of course, internet, social media, what else we have? Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, emailers, everything we can do, right? Um, and Instagram right now is a powerful tool. Right? Recently, a couple of youth came to our church at East and uh, I said, how did you get to know about APC? They said, I, uh, I was on Instagram. My friend was uh, put some pictures on Instagram and said all people's church. So I tried to find where's all people's church. And he came. Nobody invited, nothing. He was going on Instagram. Many of them come through Facebook ads. Right? So these are ways that we can uh, invite and reach out to people. Uh, music, performing arts, again, different ways. Now, let's get into chapter 14. Again, when you're using these tools, uh, remember now, if you're in a rural setting, maybe a town or a village, you know that Instagram, Facebook, may, there is a, a percentage of people who use it. You can use that. But also do your regular evangelism, right? Don't say, okay, I put poster on Instagram. Whoever sees it will come. And if nobody comes, don't blame yourself, right? You have to go out. You have to do. So depending on the area that you're in, right? So if you're in a village, don't say, I put Facebook ad. Nobody came for a youth program. No, you have to go out, right? You have to do something. So according to the area that you're in, you learn, you understand and you do ministry, OK? OK, chapter 14, sharing Christ with a Hindu. OK. So now, when it comes to sharing Christ with a Hindu or a Muslim, there are few aspects that, you know, over the, during the course of this entire semester, we've been talking about you know, how how, what the gospel is all about, and how you and I can minister effectively. So here, we're going to learn about few points that we can pull out when we are ministering to people. OK? So we touched, about, touched on it, but let's just uh, look at it a little more, right? Now, when it comes to Christianity, there is one God. He is loving, he is merciful, he is kind. But look at Hinduism. 330 million gods and goddesses. Right? They have a variety of choices. Now, never look at them and say, now, which god are you praying to today? No condemning. Right? Now, we may know all of this, but it is for our information. It is not to ridicule or mock them or make fun of them. Right. So. Understand that, OK, they have many choices. So they may go through, for each situation, they may go to different gods. But here we have one God, eternal, wise God, powerful God. Right? Two, man is sinful, yet God loves man. Here, in Hinduism, man is a part of God, meaning uh, they, when we receive in the Hindu uh, in the Hindu text, we, we gain moksha, right? So that word moksha means there'll come a time when you've attained highest level of spirituality, you become one with God, right? So here, man is sinful. Here, man is trying to reach that level of God, and that is through their own efforts. Here, it is God reaching to us. Here, it is man reaching to God. You see the difference, right? Yes or no? You see the difference, right? Here, God came as a man, reached out to us. Here, we are doing everything. In Hinduism, they are doing everything. Go to this mountain, you know, walk on your knees, roll, do all of that to reach to God. Or meditating, whatever it is, that is to reach to that level of God. Now, when it comes to scripture, Christians, we believe in the Bible, and we believe the Bible is inspired, infallible. The word infallible means it is, it is not something that is man-made. It, it is perfect. 
every word in this Bible is perfect. Nothing is imperfect. God didn't make a mistake in this. But everything that is there has a reason for it to be there. What about Song of Solomon's? There is a reason. What about Leviticus? There is a reason. What about Numbers? Have you read the book of Numbers? Only Numbers are there. There's a reason. There's a reason for it. It talks about God's, the way He does things. He's perfect. He's, he's a detailed God. He wanted so many people. So, right? What about Judges? And when you look at all the scriptures, it, it is perfect. Now, here in Hinduism, it's the Vedas. Now, here's a very important point to understand. The Bible is historically proof that these places existed. History proves it. Is there a Red Sea? Now, whether Moses parted it or no, we, that is secondary. Is there a Red Sea? Yes. Is there a land called Israel? Yes. Was there a man named Daniel? Right? It was there. Was there a, a man named Joseph and Mary? Was there a man named Jesus? Now, history, that's all history, historical proof. Even people who are not Christians, Romans, wrote and said, yes, there's a man named Jesus. We crucified him. History proves. Romans have written. Right? It's not like, okay, Jesus crucified, okay, finish, next one. No, they made a note of how many people have been crucified, how many people have been killed, how many people have been in prison. Everything was, you know, put down. Right? So there is historical proof. If the records of uh, those who were born in Bethlehem is pulled out, they will find Jesus. Jesus' name there. Because he was born in Bethlehem. You understand what I'm saying? Now, in the Vedas, it is all written out of inspiration or out of imaginations. There is no historical proof. Right? So one of the strongest facts that we as believers have is history. History is important. We have historical proof. But in the Vedas, there's no historical proof. Now, you can, we can use it at our advantage. Again, not to mock, not to ridicule them, but to say, hey, there's historical proof. You're saying, who's this Jesus? There's history, there's proof. That Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish and fed the thousands. There is proof that Jesus resurrected from the dead and he showed himself to more than 500 people. There is proof. History. What about the Vedas? It's all about imagination and their thoughts and their understanding. Uh, Gertrude, I'll just finish this and then I'll, uh, I'll ask you the question, right? Okay, what about Jesus Christ? They believe that God who became man and God was the only provision and he was the only provision to enter into God's presence. What do they believe as Jesus is? Jesus is either ignored or he is accepted by many. He's either ignored or accepted. So some of them, if you say Jesus, they'll get angry. Some of them, if you say Jesus, your wish. Some of them, if you say Jesus, they're interested. Right? Yesterday, at, after church, this young man came up to me, and he was a, not, from our, not a Christian. He was an unbeliever. But he was so interested, saying, oh, I like what, you know, I like about all of this community. I like, I like this whole thing about Jesus and what he did, but I don't understand. Right? Uh, but it was good to see somebody who was hungry to know about God. Now, he's not a believer yet, but he's still trying to understand what it is. Right? He was not able to understand the praise and worship. So he asked me, what, did, what was the songs about? And what, what did, why I saw people raising their hands. What is it? And so I had to, I, I explained to him, this is what it is. Right? This is what praise and worship is. When we talk about the Bible, this is what God says. Right? So there are times people will accept, people will ignore. 
we got to move on right third fourthly life's purpose what is our main purpose in life to become a pastor and start a church what is our main purpose in life our main purpose is to be like jesus yes if your main purpose in life is to become a pastor please change it or if your main purpose in life is to become prophet evangelist and all of that please change first number one is our main purpose in life is to be like jesus out of that will flow all the gifts and callings right so what's our main purpose to have a relationship with jesus to be like jesus now what is the purpose for hinduism main purpose is there is good karma and there is bad karma the more good you do the more good you will end up having the more bad you do the more bad you will receive so that is why when you look at these you know businessmen and these rich people uh, and people who are from other faiths especially hindus when they you know they give millions of dollars or money towards children and prostitution homes and all of these uh, or you know centers children disabled people why do they do all that you now we feel hey you know they are doing much more than what christians do maybe it's true also they may be doing so much more but they are doing it for their own gain ah i am doing good so good will come back to me in my next life you understand but when we do it as believers it is not so that good will come back to me we do it because that's what christ told us to do why did mother teresa go and sit with all the lepers there was a there's a book uh, there's an article this other man writes okay he wanted to donate money to uh, this quite a rich person a sikh right uh, a punjabi right a sikh person he was very impressed with mother teresa's work and said i'll come and to calcutta and i will i want to donate some money to mother teresa on the wonderful work she's doing mother teresa said okay you come and he came there and mother teresa was not there so they asked where is where is she oh she's there sitting with the lepers so the uh, the people went and called her she said no tell him to come in so they took him into the lepers household lepers colony so as he went in his the smell of the lepers started coming by the time he reached where mother teresa is he vomited once he couldn't handle that smell but mother teresa is cleaning the wounds nicely putting the towel cleaning up all the wounds wrapping up the wounds everything and that sick person said, you don't feel anything what a foul smell is coming here i've already you know vomited because of the smell offensive smell she said the smell and all after a few weeks you get used to it they are people now mother teresa didn't do it for karma she did it because the love of christ was in her you cannot do it on your own strength but here in hinduism good karma bad karma you see the difference there they may be doing a good work it's wonderful but they're doing it for their own benefit when we do something we do it so that god is glorified see the difference there heaven what do they think about what do we think about heaven the place of eternal joy for all of us as believers but in for them for the hindus it is attainment of nirvana which is moksha that is liberation from the cycle of birth right so good karma next life you'll get again good karma and then again good karma right and then karma goes good 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 finally no more rebirth that is nirvana you've attained highest level of goodness there's no they don't believe in heaven and hell right what about hell 
uh, a place where there's torment and a place where there is rejection from Jesus Christ. But uh, for Hindus, it's a place on earth. That's what, being trapped in that cycle of reincarnation again, again, and again. Right? And now the sad part is they also believe that the karma can be that next year, if I don't do good, then my next life I may become an animal. Then as an animal I have to do good to become back a human. So it's 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 going all wrong, right? That reincarnation. Uh, so that for them is more of a hell than what we believe in, right? So points to emphasize. There is sin and evil. There is forgiveness of sins. Right? Sin and evil is there both in Hinduism, in every religion. But forgiveness of sins is only through Jesus Christ. Now, they may do a lot of things, but they're not confirmed on their forgiveness of sins. They're not assured of their forgiveness. But are we assured? When we go to Jesus and pray, Lord Jesus, please forgive me, what does Jesus do? He forgives our sins. Are you assured of it? But there is no assurance, right? Um, then you can talk about Christ, how he is the sinless, perfect one, uh, and what he did for us on the cross. And then we, talk, we can also talk about his transforming power in our life. What what his presence or his power does in our life, right? So there's a list of books here, uh, recommended resources. If you'd like, you can read them. But there are also other books like Jesus Among Other Gods. Uh, but whatever you can, right? Begin to read and understand other faiths. And then you will, you'll know, okay, this is what the gospel is offering. We begin to value the scriptures more. And that way, you'll be also able to give a good defense for the gospel to people. Right? Right. Gertrude, do you have a question? Do you have a thought you'd like to share? Yes, Pastor. Uh, I just want to ask you is there a discrepancy on Jesus' birth? On, on the word of God? Uh, at the birth of Jesus, the date he was born, is there a discrepancy? Like many uh, sects in Christianity, they celebrate his birthday on a different day. Okay, yes. Okay, so the question is, um, now here we celebrate Christmas, uh, Christ's birthday as Christmas, December 25th. So Gertrude's question is, is there a di discrepancy? Now, Gertrude, if you look at it, we know that Jesus was not born on December 25th. Right, he was definitely, yeah. yeah, he was definitely not born on that date. It is only when later on, after the Roman calendar, after many years, uh, you know, a certain date was given to remember the birth of Jesus Christ, and the date was December twenty fifth. So we know that Jesus was not born on December twenty fifth, right? But the point is, even even when you look at Good Friday and Easter, it was not like exactly the same date. Jesus died. And uh, Jesus resurrected on no, right now. Now we must understand that these are dates set by certain governments, and uh, during the early Grecian calendars, these dates were set to remember their life, right? So if you look at uh, the birth of Jesus, it's to remember the life. You know, Jesus was born, and then you look at Good Friday, it was to remember that he died on the cross. Easter to remember that he rose again from the dead. So it is not. The dates that we follow are just dates for us to remember. It is not the exact same date. Right? Is that okay, Gertrude? Yeah, okay, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Okay, so we're getting it. We'll just go into our last chapter and we'll be able to complete this course. Um, sharing Christ with a Muslim. Right? Now, let's look at the same uh, six points here. So it's six, seven points. Again, God, eternal, one true God. In Islam, again, there's a lot of similarities. How many of you have friends who are Muslims? Very good. How many of you have tried sharing the gospel with them? How many of you, how many of them, 
you know, they tried to understand or they were like, okay, very good, very good. You know, if I tell you the truth, for me, it's easier with a Muslim than a Hindu. The Hindu, you have to, you know, you have to keep explaining so many things, no? But Islam is very close. Why are you celebrating Bakrid? Number one question I ask. What is it about? So they'll start explaining. Oh, Abraham was there. Abraham, God told Abraham, take Ishmael and go up the mountain. Right? And then God provided the ram. And so we celebrate Bakrid. Right? So close, yet so far. Right? But it's very easy. Very easy for the Muslim, right? Uh, I mean, I'm not saying very easy, but they've 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 got they believe in the Torah, the first five books. So you've already got a you know you got a hand there. God is the creator that they they also believe. Jesus is a prophet. They they also believe. What more you want? You just need to be able to articulate in the right way the gospel, right? Okay, God. God is true, one God, same thing, Islam. But here, they believe in Allah, which is not the same God who is Jehovah. Right? Uh, it, it's, it's different. Secondly, man is sinful and valuable, valuable to God. But here, Islam, man is good. Right? By nature, man is good. Why? Because God created man. So they believe, right? So you see the difference here. We say... We are not good. Here, we are good, but we're continuing to change and become more like God. Right? So slight differences here. Three, we believe in the Bible, which is perfect. They believe in the Quran, which is perfect. So here comes the biggest challenge. We'll say, hey, Bible is perfect. Right? Now, Muslims will say, hey, Quran is perfect. They've also got history. We also got history. There was really a man named Muhammad. Right? There was really what, uh, you know, Abu Bakr and all of that, how Islam came into being, the division of uh, Sunni and uh, Shia Muslims, all of that. All of that is history. It's there. So we'll say, if we say, hey, Bible is true, they'll say, good, Bible also is good. But Quran is true. Because they've also got history. Right? So we must know how to bring out the right things, the right scriptures, the right words. In the Quran, there's a lot of, lot of uh, verses, if you read it, it's very similar to the Bible. Very similar. God is the one faithful God. God is the provider. Nothing, we, everything that we have is from God. All of those verses are there. Right? One day we are called to live, to become like God. Right? Oh, only thing there's no Holy Spirit, right? There's no Messiah. But a lot of the verses in the Quran talk about you know God being just, God being merciful, God being a God of vengeance, a righteous God, all of that is there. Right? Life purpose as Christians, we believe that we want to be build a relationship with God and have a a uh, close relationship, build our faith in God. In Islam, just submit to God. If God says, do this, you have to do it. What about us as believers? God said, we do, do this. We'll come up with seven different ways how not to do it. God, instead of this, can we do it like this? No. Here, submit, submit. That is why... They are willing to give their life. Whether it's good or bad, that's okay. But they're willing to give their life. But you see the difference. Here we submit to God to become, so that we become like God, to honor Him. Here we submit to God in, in Islam. They submit to Allah, whether it is good or bad, that is secondary. Right? So you, you see the difference there. Right? So one of the ways that we can bring out the gospel, we can say, hey, when you submit to God, what does God expect out of you? Does God want you to be holy? And uh, when what about all the things that we do in the flesh? There's all sinful. What does God think about that? 
ask that question. Right? Here I feel that if I sin, I do bad, I can just I I I, I feel very bad and I, I have to go back, ask God for forgiveness. What do you do? They'll say, I go to Hajj, I go for pilgrimage, I, I do fasting, I'll go, uh, they'll say a lot of things, a lot of things are there, right? But then there is no confirmation. There is no, when there is no change inside us, it's just outward change, right? Again, hell, oh, sorry, heaven, it's a place for us as believers to be with Jesus, a place of joy. But for Islam, it is only who Allah chooses that will be there. If Allah chooses this fellow should be in heaven, he'll be there. Now, whether he killed 100 people or no, that is secondary. If, he, if Allah chooses, he's there. But for us, yes, God chooses us, but we live a life worthy. We live a life holy, and God calls us to be in his presence. Yes? You see the difference? We make that choice and God makes it available for us hell is a place of torment and uh, those, for those who are rejected by Christ and for Islam they again believe in hell right they believe that it is a place for those who are rejected by Allah um, Islam means submission to God Muslim is one who submits to God right um, founded by Muhammad uh, in 610 AD when he received direct messages from the angel Gabriel so the whole of the Quran he believes that Muhammad no the Muslims believe that Muhammad was sitting and an angel came angel Gabriel came and told him you write all of this all these revelations you write it down so he wrote it down so that's why they believe that the Quran is perfect. Now, what does the Bible believe? We also believe it's inspiration by God. God, through His Holy Spirit, ministered to people and they wrote it, wrote the Word of God. So, which is perfect? Bible or Quran? So that's the biggest debate. Say, hey, this God, God inspired us and wrote this. Quran, God inspired them also and wrote it. The only difference is it's a different God. Now, Muhammad is saying that Gabriel angel came and wrote, right? But we don't know, right? Here, there's history, there's proof, right? So again, it's 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 the way we minister, the way we reach out to them, should be very, in a very graceful method. Yet, we can depend on the power of God, the Word of God, to touch lives. Right? The confession, which is a shahada, is the foundation of Muslims. You know, the shahada is the confession, twofold confession. I will bear witness that there is no God but God. I will bear witness that Muhammad is a true prophet of God. Right? There is one God, and Muhammad is a true prophet of God. That is entirety of Islam. Here, Christianity, there is one God. And he's three part being, and as believers, we will meet with him, or we we can we become like him. We have our sins forgiven, all of that, right? So you see here the five pillars of Islam, shahada. Now all of this you can learn, right? Why? Because when you're ministering to people, you can talk about it. You can ask a Muslim, hey, what do you pray five times a day? Wonderful. What do you pray? Number one question you can ask, what do you pray? Right. Uh, then you got Salat, five times you pray. Zakat, alms to the poor, very important that is. right. Then fasting for Ramadan. Hajj, pilgrimage to Mecca and Jihad, the holy war against worldly lusts. You know, you know why Islam want to eradicate every religion? Because they believe that every other religion is atrocities, meaning it's it's... It's a false God. Everything else is false. Only Islam should live forever. So that's why they do what they do. So it's part of their scriptures. Right? Uh, there's a question here from Akhil. Hindu friend does not 
debate, whereas a Muslim friend does keep the debate going on. Uh, it again depends on people, right? So sometimes, Akhil, uh, Hindus also will keep debating if they have a lot of questions. Uh, Muslims, it's just that they know a lot from the Bible as well. So the debate usually goes longer, right? Uh, I wanted to complete this. OK, so we'll stop here. Uh, if I'm not able to come the next week, but we will uh, try and complete this. OK, uh, we'll be there next week. We'll try and complete this. And we will, if you have any questions, you can ask. And next week will be our last uh, week. We, we would have completed this course. Right? Thank you so much. Have a good day ahead. God bless.